let me introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Louis uh, Lisa Mazang. Uh, he is a professor at uh, CIC Bioma Green in San Sebastian, and he has received um, many, many scientific awards and honors. Uh, he serves as an exec uh, executive editor at ACS Nano and uh, on the editorial uh, advisory board of science, uh, advanced function materials, many others. So he is going to talk about uh, chiroplasmonics in colloidal nanoparticles. The floor is yours, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, well, okay. So again, thank you, Laura, for the introduction, and thank you, Javier, for inviting me to be here among this uh, uh, very amazing set of speakers and this very young and, uh, and, uh, and full audience uh, in the room. Um, I'm probably going to be one of the very few speakers uh, who will focus on chemistry more than physics. And so I start, uh, well, not apologizing, but warning you about that. Um, yeah, this you can see already in the title. I'm using the word colloidal. This is already distinctive to most of what you have seen so far, where lithography was key. Uh, we work mainly with materials in liquids, and we try to study what happens when the particles are moving around, and this is why they are called colloidal. So I'm starting full start with chemistry. And as uh, you can see here, we have recently become interested, or maybe not so recently, we, st we became interested in studying what happens when there is asymmetry in the materials that we are working with. And this is something that as chemists we had in our undergraduate training, mainly in organic chemistry talking about molecules where there is asymmetry, meaning that the molecule cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. And so this is something that imposes many peculiar properties and can be achieved not only by playing around with the internal structure of the molecule, it can also bring about when you're bringing molecules, not necessarily chiral in themselves, in contact with each other, becoming suprachiral when they organized into asymmetric structures. Now, the first observation of, or the first identification of this type of asymmetry in molecular systems was discovered by Pasteur, the same Pasteur of the penicillin, back in the 1850s, when he managed to separate the two enantiomers of tartaric acid. This was actually quite nice if you read about it. So there is a reference here. The trick, or what made Pasteur famous in this context, was that he was able to recognize that when crystallizing tartrate, and this is one of the original samples, he was able to determine that some crystals had a defect on this side and the others on the other side. So he was separating by hand some crystals from the others. And then he was able to recognize, uh, well, sorry, this is a different story. He was able to recognize that when separating, they, he could identify different response to incoming light depending on the enantiomer that he was illuminating. And this is the basis of what we now know as circular dichroism or differential absorption. When you illuminate a chiral material with circular polarized light, either polarized to the right or to the left, there may be a difference at a certain wavelength range, and this is what gives rise to these plots, which we, which we call circular dichroism. Now, going back to the other plot that I was showing you, this is one of the examples of why discriminating what we call enantiomers, so the two different forms of chiral molecules, is extremely important for you because when you are making drugs, and this is one of the most terrible examples, you can either have one form, in this case the S-thalidomide, which is beneficial for pregnant, for pregnant women to help them cope with side effects of the pregnancy, while if they are treated with the wrong enantiomer, this induces terrible birth defects on the children uh, when they are born. 
And so it's extremely important to separate one enantiomer from the other so that you can treat diseases properly. And this happens in many different cases. Even it is uh, disca being discussed that chirality is at the very origin of life. And without chirality, probably there would be no life. And so this is why we constantly seek inspiration in nature. And there are plenty of examples in nature where chirality influences dramatically the properties of living systems. For example, in plants, you have many plants which form these sort of twisted morphologies, which are extremely important to provide mechanical stability and at the same time flexibility so that they can live in very harsh environments. And this comes about by the self-assembly of chiral units, in this case sugars, which form cellulose and then the cellulose crystals also assemble with each other, become together with other biomolecules and they end up forming these three-dimensional bulk scale uh, helical structures. In many uh, little shells, the morphology is also extremely important for the uh, functionality, for the mechanical resistance and for the environment where they live. And this also comes from the organization of chiral inorganic crystals, typically bound to each other by, uh, sorry, by chiral uh, biomolecules, very small ones like amino acids, for example. And of course, this has served as inspiration to many people, and there are plenty of examples in the literature where people try to copy exactly what nature is doing. And here you have a couple of examples where by including uh, amino acids in the presence of very tiny uh, metal oxides uh, crystals, they end up forming something that looks very much like the natural shells. Uh, this is another example on tellurum nano nanoparticles. The crystallographic structure of tellurum leads to also enantiomeric forms, and you can obtain these twisted structures by self-assembly of very, very tiny units. Now, in plasmonics, when we play with colloids, we use chemistry to direct the growth and we play around, uh, around with many variables. We typically use very tiny seeds, same as I was telling you uh, just a minute ago, and then we try to induce crystallographic growth into specific directions so that we can control the morphology in a way that all the particles in the system are as identical to each other as possible. And we and many others have been able to prepare particles of all these different morphologies and many others you can even not imagine that can be made really nicely reproducible at the nanoscale. And for each of these morphologies, you can calculate or even measure the interaction with light or with electrons that tell you about the interaction of uh, far field with, uh, of light with these particles being dispersed in solution or being deposited on substrates. And so, of course, for, ev uh, for every application, you can design your material so that you end up with the property that you want to apply. Now, what happens if you bring particles close to each other? Well, you know this much better than I do. You get all sorts of coupling effects depending on the organization of the particles. You can get simple so-called plasmon hybridization, or you can get more fancy effects, like Naomi Hallas reported something that she called uh, aromatic plasmons. And the topic of the lecture today, uh, chiral plasmons, when you organize particles in an a uh, chiral arrangement, like helical uh, uh, arrays of particles. And there are also discussions about something that you could call plasmonic polymers, depending on uh, the way you organize many particles close to each other, in regular way or in disordered manner. Okay. So, how can you identify chiral effects in plasmonic nanomaterials? Well, there was already this very simple way of describing circular dichroism in arrays, in helical arrays of small metal particles by Sasha Govorov, where basically the dipole coupling method was applied. And uh, what he described was basically that if you organize spherical particles into a helical array, 
as soon as you have four or more particles following this sort of organization, you can also obtain circular dichroism, but different to what you typically obtain in organic molecules where the CD is restricted to the UV or maybe a violet part of this electromagnetic spectrum, you can obtain these very well-defined signals in the visible or even in the near infrared. And this would make this type of signals very selective of plasmonic systems. Now, uh, already more than 10 years ago, uh, Baptiste Auguier, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, decided to explore what happens if you elongate the building blocks. So instead of organizing spheres into helical arrays, you now organize ellipsoids. And uh, it turns out that if you organize ellipsoids already with two of them, you can obtain circular dichroism. And this is simply geometrical factor. You have two fingers and you put them on top of each other, but not parallel, immediately you have a chiral structure. And this is exactly what is happening here. If you now play around with the dimensions of the ellipsoids and the separation between them and the orientation angle, then you can al obtain all sorts of different effects. And you can even calculate the contributions of absorption and scattering. So you could also distinguish between circular dichroism, which is related to absorption, and rotatory dispersion, which is related to scattering. Now, this is actually quite important for many of the plasmonic systems that we work with. OK, so the prediction that you can obtain circular dichroism, or at least differential absorbance, differential extinction, with two particles was demonstrated in practice. So this was an experiment that we did a long time ago, where we made this sort of gold nano dumbbells. And then we could functionalize them with hydrophobic molecules, mainly at the tips. And then by simply dispersing them in an organic solvent, like uh, THF, and then you add water slowly, you promote the aggregation because of hydrophobic forces. And then if you stabilize the aggregates at, early, at an early aggregation state, you can isolate a dispersion of pairs of nanorods. And then if you measure the circular dichroism or the differential absorption in dispersion, surprise, surprise, you get nothing. And you get nothing because in this system there is nothing to promote one enantiomer to dominate over the other. So here you get a racemic mixture of the two possible orientations of the nanorods, and this is why globally you get zero effect. However, if you measure individually, and this is something that Stefan Link did when he was at Rice University, and Peter Norlander did the simulations, then you do obtain the CD, in this case, differential scattering, because you're measuring in the dark field mode. You obtain well-defined CD for pairs of dumbbells when they are not located parallel to each other. Okay? So this is a nice demonstration that indeed with two particles you can obtain these very well-defined signals. And as you can see here, when you have elongated particles, the CD signal is already in the near infrared. At that time we were also discovering that if you can prepare helical fibers of an organic molecule, then you can also induce the organization of many particles into this helical organization. And then you can try to measure also in dispersion the differential absorbance in this case, depending on whether you are absorbing spheres or you are absorbing nanorods. And we found that for spheres, the only signal we could measure was the one related to the fibers themselves. But when we had nanorods, we obtained a very well-defined, actually more intense than, we, than what we ever expected, circular dichroism in the near-infrared region corresponding to the two plasma modes of the nanorods that we are absorbing to the fibers. And actually, this was explained by the theory that if you have many pairs of rods located close to each other promoting circular dichroism of a similar signal, then the signal accumulates and you have millions of pairs of nanorods in this system that collectively give you a very well-defined signal. So this is not very well controlled, but you can obtain very, well, very, very strong signals. Now another example, which is very different, 
is the case where you promote the aggregation of nanorolls in a tip-to-tip -tip fashion. And this is something that we did a few years ago with uh, Luciano Galantini at Sapienza University in Rome, where he convinced us to use uh, some bile salt surfactants that could interpenetrate in between the surfactant molecules we typically use to stabilize nanorods. And by doing this, we were obtaining this tip to t assembly that has, uh, has been reported many times, for example, for binding dithiols on gold nanorods. But in this case, we are forming chains where in between each of the two nanorods, we have surfactant when we have a co-surfactant, which is chiral. And we observed also a very well-defined uh, circular dichroism signal. And this was actually quite unexpected because here, if you look in the, in the electron microscope, you see chains. There is no reason to think that in solution, this will be twisted in any specific way. And this is when we called Javier to uh, help us explain what we were seeing. And he, well, worked out the theory to actually calculate the hotspots in between the gold nanorods in these chains, which would be enough to justify simply the enhancement of the rotary dispersion of the molecules that we have in the gaps at the wavelength at which we are obtaining the maximum enhancement of the electric field. So here we have circular dichroism local enhancement, which is induced by the sort of standard hotspots that you obtain when you are coupling particles with each other. And we are seeing the signal at wavelengths where usually the molecule would be silent because the scattering rotary dispersion is extremely small. Okay? So these are different effects to promote CD signals in plasmonic systems. And of course, if you want to do this in a controlled way, you can also apply the well-known DNA origami systems. There have been plenty of reports related to organizing either spheres, rods, or even other shapes, and obtain very well-defined systems where you can also uh, measure and, uh, and uh, calculate the uh, chiral op uh, plasmonic response of these arrays of nanoparticles. Very recently, uh, we somehow collaborated with uh, Laura Liu, who did a very nice experiment showing that CD can help you analyze the dynamic rearrangement of gold nanoparticles onto these uh, CD uh, DNA origami systems, meaning that you can fabricate systems that can be manipulated by chemical stimuli so that you can change the optical response of the system and even monitor what is happening by recording these CD signals. I'm not going to discuss this in much detail because I want to go into a different way of exploring things. Before I switch to single nanoparticles, I wanted to show you another example, which we were actually quite excited about a few years ago. And this was applying these CD signals that you obtain selectively when you organize gold nanorods into helical arrangements to observe the formation of amyloid fibers. And why do we want to watch formation of amyloid fibers? Because they are responsible for many of the neuro neurodegenerative disorders that we observe in elder people. And so if you're able to identify the formation of these fibers at very early stages, you might be able to help understand how these diseases work, and you may even be, help, be uh, helping to identify the early stages of the disease. And so what we did was initially to incubate some of these model proteins so that they would form fibers in the lab. And then by incubating them with gold nanorods, the nanorods were sticking on top of the fibers, and we were observing these well-defined circular dichroism signals. And by looking at these systems in cryo-electron tomography, our colleague Sara Valls provided us with movies like this, reconstructions that show that indeed we are obtaining double helical structures that coincide with what has been reported to be the structure very often in these fibers. Uh, formed by these uh, amyloid proteins. And uh, to our amaze, we actually observed that when we teamed up with a group specialized in these diseases, they collected brains from dead people from the biobank, extracted 
the parts of the brain where these fibers are supposed to accumulate, and then we mix them with the gold nanorods. We observed that for the brains from people who died from Parkinson's, we could measure the CD signal, very similar to what we obtained in vitro. And for the brains of people who died from other diseases, the signal was roughly in the noise level. So, yes, we don't have yet a solution to identify these diseases, but we may be on the way. All right, now, second part of the talk. We want to obtain or actually to impose plasmonic chirality into single particles. And this is something that, again, has been reported already 10 years ago for particles made by electron lithography. You can use uh, e-beam lithography to shape materials on surfaces. You can obtain uh, helical structures on little pieces of gold. You can even extract them from the substrate and then measure the properties when they are dispersed in the liquid. But this is a process that we chemists call very inefficient and extremely expensive. And so the challenge that we had was to try to make something like this in a similar way to what we have been using for the other shapes that I showed you earlier in the talk. So using chemistry to actually promote the growth of face center cubic metal crystals into asymmetric structures. And this sounds extremely challenging, but it is feasible, and I'll show you how. So the first clear demonstration that it was feasible was published by the group of, the group of Kita and Am back in 2018, when they discovered that if they start from gold cubes and also from octahedrons and now from some other shapes, and they promoted the reduction of gold chloride on top of these existing cubic seeds in the presence of amino acids like cysteine or small peptides, they were able to promote the growth into structures like this. And depending on the enantiomer of the amino acid that they were using during this seeded growth process that we call, they were obtaining also like different orientations in the growth of these helicoids. And this was also reflected in extremely efficient circular dichroism signals, much higher intensity than what you typically get in organic or biomolecules, several orders of magnitude higher. And so, well, for us, it's actually quite interesting to try to understand how these particles grow. I'm probably not going to discuss a lot today, um, but there will be, I mean, this is something that really needs to be understood in order to be able to control it, okay? So the main point here is related to how the amino acids are absorbed on the surface of the initial particles and how they can affect the organization at the atomic scale so that you can obtain kinks and terraces, which end up being chiral at the atomic scale, so that when you keep depositing gold atoms on lattices that have this local chirality, they evolve into these intricate twisted structures. Now, more recently, using the same method, we discovered that the same thing you can do on the gold nanorods that we typically use, and then you can obtain these sort of elongated twisted particles very well defined. It's actually quite remarkable that when you're doing this process for billions and trillions of particles in a very small volume of water, growing all at the same time but under stirring, so you're never even sure that everything, the, the, the same thing is happening everywhere in the solution, you obtain particles that all look roughly the same. At the local scale, they are all slightly different, but Overall, they have the same morphology. So you start from something that is extremely well defined, typically octagonal cross section, and then by simply grow in the presence of one or the other amino acid, you can get circular dichroism into one direction or the other. And here you see this is a comparison between the experimental CD signal that we obtain from the dispersion of, as I say, trillions of particles being floating around and the calculations using a uh, boundary element method from the actual outcome of the electron tomography signals. So we can calculate directly from this structure and we obtain signals that are very similar to what we obtain collectively for the colloid. Uh, 
And it's also possible to calculate the electric field enhancement and the illumination with circular polarized right, light to the right or to the left. And then if you look carefully, you can compare and see the differences in the behavior of the particle depending on how you illuminate. Okay, uh, well, so again, uh, related to the growth mechanism, we believe that the mechanism that proposed by NAM is also uh, in effect here. And this comes from atomic resolution electron tomography, where we can identify the nature of the facets, and we can really recognize the predictions from uh, DFT calculations that tell us the changes in the energy of the facets, depending on the absorption of one or the other enantiomer, and predicting the formation of chiral facets that then can evolve into these twisted structures. Okay, now, at the time that Nam was working on this paper, or at least at the time that he had submitted it, we were starting to work on something a bit different, and which was related to the knowledge that we have on how you can go from very tiny quasi-spherical seeds all the way into well-defined nanorods. And this knowledge is related to separating nucleation growth, same as NAM did, and then using some additives that we call shape-directing agents, which are typically related to surfactants and sometimes a few other things that I will not discuss in much detail. But anyway, we know that under certain conditions we can promote this growth, and we know that the surfactant is organizing on the surface of the particles. The typical picture that we have given and seen in thousands of papers was something like this, where there is a bilayer of surfactant, which is absorbing on the surface through an ammonium head group uh, for the one layer, and then another layer is interdigitating the hydrophobic parts, and then it leaves charged head groups which are facing the solvent and promoting the stability that you need in aqueous solvents. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense. We also know that in the presence of different additives, you can tune the influence of thermodynamics and kinetics, and by tuning these two contributions to crystal growth, you can uh, direct the changes in shapes and sizes and, uh, and anisotropy. Okay, so is it true that we have a perfect bilayer on the particles that we are growing? Well, probably not. And this comes mainly at the moment from theoretical or numerical calculations, mainly from molecular dynamics, where mainly the group of Sulpice in Germany, but also some of our contribution, uh, predicts that depending on how much surfactant you have in the solution next to the particles, you can e get either full coverage of the surface or you can even get the formation of sort of channels where the surfactant is occupying partially the surface of the crystal but leaving some areas. And this is most likely dyna a dynamic process. And this is actually quite interesting but it, because it means that if you know how to manipulate the organization of the surfactant on the surface, you may be able to also manipulate the further growth of these particles. So this is something that we discussed in this uh, recent account, many different ways of observing how the bilayer forms on these particles and also how different parameters can affect the organization of the surfactant. Now for the topic that we have at hand, Two of my postdocs, Jesus Mosquera and Guillermo González Rubio, they are both tenure track professors now in different universities in Spain. They were thinking that if we add chiral co-surfactants to a dispersion of the surfactant that we typically use on the gold nanorods, we may be able to obtain helicity in the micelles when these surfactants aggregate with each other. And then again, our colleagues in Madrid did molecular dynamic simulations. They indeed confirmed that both for the molecules we call binol or binamine, you can obtain this sort of helical micelles. And even more, you can even simulate the organization, the helical wrapping of these micelles on existing gold cylinders. So if this is the case, which has not been fully confirmed yet, then the hypothesis was that if you now deposit more gold atoms, they may follow the pattern 
that these helical micelles are imposing on the gold nanorod that you're uh, using as a seed. And indeed, this works. So these were the initial nanorods, and then by growing them after incubation in the course of fact and binamine, and then promoting reduction of gold chloride, you obtain these wrinkled structures where the central rod remains, and then you have a sort of quasi-helical structure growing around, which can be thicker and thicker depending on how much gold you're depositing on the original rods. Okay, so now if you measure the optical activity, you can see that you can not only get extremely efficient processes, almost 30% uh, optical activity, but also you can manipulate the wavelength at which this happens by playing around with the dimensions of these wrinkles. Depending on the enantiomer of the cosofactan, you can obtain positive or negative CD, so you can also obtain the two enantiomers of your plasmonic system. We can now also quantify the helicity of the particles by analyzing the electron tomography reconstruction at the nanometer scale, which helps us see also the potential defects in the particles that we grow. We can monitor the kinetics of growth of these materials, so we can see that initially we had like thicker rods and then the wrinkles start to form. I wanted to show you, I'm running out of time, I probably ran out of time already, but I wanted to show you this, uh, which is quite unusual, or at least it sounded counterintuitive to us. So you have seen that initially you have the nanorods, they are already quite big, and then you grow them, they become thicker, and then you obtain these thin wrinkles growing around. If you now measure with an integrating sphere the contributions of absorption and scattering for these growing particles, you see that initially absorption and scattering roughly have the same intensity for the rods that we are using. When you grow them thicker, definitely scattering dominates over absorption. But then when the wrinkles start to grow, counterintuitively, absorption dominates clearly over scattering. And this is simply because you have these wrinkles which are very thin and extending longer from the central rod, so they contribute much more to absorption than to scattering. And this you can also see in the simulations that we, that we can get. And so the thin parts of the particle override the contribution of scattering from the central part. Uh, okay, so same as before, you can see actually these particles have much stronger differences between right and left illumination for the same enantiomer of the particle. And uh, just to finish, I wanted to introduce that we have now different ways of imposing either twisting or wrinkling of particles. This is something that my student Kyle Van Gordon will discuss tomorrow. And we are also starting to see the application of these materials into sensing, which my postdoc Ben Tadjel will discuss on Wednesday. So with this, I finish. Thank you for your attention, and I'll, happy to, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Then the talk is open for discussion. Yes, please. Um, what do you think about, I was wondering, like, uh, heterogeneous nanoparticles, like, for example, uh, gold with the Janus-like structure with, I don't know, iron, cobalt, or so what, or moon crescent-like uh, structure. I think that they can induce uh, a sort of chirality in a single uh, nanoparticles. What do you think about that? Well, uh, crescents have been reported, and I think Javier here has contributed theoretically to calculate the optical activity of crescent arrays. These were also made by lithography. Very nice work by uh, Nicholas Vogel in Erlangen. Uh, making them in solution probably is possible, but it will be a lot more work. Now, related to combinations of materials, in the same paper where we initially reported the wrinkle particles, we also demonstrated that we can grow platinum in a similar way. And I think this actually will be quite interesting, not, maybe not so much for plasmonics, but much more for catalysis, for example. We also did some work with palladium. Uh, the only issue is that these materials are much more lossy at these wavelengths, and so the plasmonic effects are quenched quite dramatically. 
uh, we were actually quite surprised to see that when we include silver, we also see a quenching. And this we don't understand yet very well. So we are trying to find ways to grow pure silver helical structures. And maybe there, we, there is already a way going on. Uh, and then we'll see whether we, this can be improved or not. But uh, putting silver on top of gold did not help for us. Thank you. Okay, I see two questions. First, yes. this gentleman. Yes, um, thank you for the very uh, intriguing talk. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, one is, um, so you have used this for chiral differentiation uh, for this kind of particles, but have you ever used this for um, differentiating between the handedness of vorticity of light, like the orbital angular momentum of optical fields? No, no. Uh, for the moment, we are making the materials and characterizing their, they say, rotatory power. Uh -huh. And so how efficient they are at either rotating or distinguishing light with different polarizations. Okay. Um, so again, I think that they can have an, uh, an effect on changing the polarization of light. And this is something that we are doing also in collaboration with a group in Lyon, mm -hmm. where by preparing like glasses with our particles embedded in the glass, you can see changes in the polarization of incident light. Mm -hmm. um, and the other question is, I was looking at your um, nanorods with this binamine system, yep. and I noticed that other than the fact that it has a certain kind of vortical structure or helical structure, it also has a lot of like wedge-like shapes that could probably create a lot of uh, enhanced field, uh, like field enhancement, do you see something like this for this case? Yeah, this is what you saw in the last simulation, which I played very fast. But indeed, these very tiny gaps between the wrinkles provide very large field enhancements. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. A fundamental theorem that you can transform any chiral object into its mirror image without passing through an intermediate non chiral geometry. Now, this means there's no intrinsically geometrical way of assigning a handedness left or right to a geometrical object. And any assignment has to be related to the chirality of something you're interrogating it with. In your case, it's polarized light. Now, my question is, does this lack of intrinsic geometrical assignment of left and right have any consequences for what you do? Um, well, this is actually quite intriguing, but in the materials we are making, we are pretty sure that there are both right and left-handed parts of the particle, which are contributing in different ways to the, to the interaction with light. And so I think that there is still plenty of work to do to really understand what gives you the far-field collective signal, because as, as you're saying, depending on how the local, locally the geometry of the particle is, the interaction with light will be different. And in fact, I think for, uh, this is more important for the wrinkle system, because here you have many inclinations and many areas which are somehow curved at the atomic scale, which will also have a very important uh, sort of chiral effect. So I think that there are plenty of questions left to be answered in these systems. Thank you. Michael, I, I had permission to ask you a question. So I guess you are aware about the Immanuel Kant challenge. Have you heard about that? Um, the, the German philosopher Kant, oh, yes. at some stage, wrote a challenge. And the challenge is that you cannot communicate the notion of left or right to, your, uh, to somebody else without seeing them. Yes, Fein Feynman discusses this. Yeah, yeah but this, is, this came from Kant. Yeah. Um, the, the, the holy grail of um, chirality, at least for people like me, is if you can rotate the polarization of light, i.e. the optical activity, within one wavelength. How close are we to that? I guess you would have to scale up your structures in size because it's essentially the magnetic field you're generating that does the rotation and you can't generate a big magnetic field from a small structure. So is there any possibility that that might happen, this extreme optical activity using your structures? 
So I'm not sure I understand. So are you asking whether we can switch to longer wavelengths or to concentrate to a single wavelength? No, I'm asking if, if you define that optical activity, it's how many radians you uh, turn the light through in, in a meter. And I'm asking if you can turn the polarization of the light through pi mm. in one wavelength. Oof. That's, hard, that that's a hard one. Um, yeah, uh, that would be like perfect optical activity, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, so far we are finding limits around 20%, 25% of... Uh, in, in one wavelength? Uh, at, the, at the maximum wavelength of our CD signal. Uh, in one wavelength? In, in one wavelength, yes. That's, that's impressive, thank you. Thank yes. You. All right, uh, because of the time, then we stop the discussion. Thank you so much, Luis, uh, for the fantastic talk. Uh, let me